Here now, a reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 25. As I read these words, I invite you to listen for a good word from the Lord. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like many of you, our family is walking more than we used to. If the weather is nice, we will put on our walking shoes, leash up our dog Murphy, and we will stroll down the hill on our street to the end of the cul-de-sac and back at least twice a day. It is only about a mile round trip, but it is always an adventure. We start out walking, but inevitably that isn't enough for our daughter Hattie. She will turn and say, Daddy, let's run. Let's beat Mommy. She can't catch us. And we will take off as fast as we can. She will run and jump over the cracks in the street that she pretends is hot lava. She will balance on the side of the curb like a tightrope walker or a gymnast. And eventually we will make it to the cul-de-sac where there are large stones marking a couple of the driveways. And Hattie will rush over to one, declare herself the winner, and then throw her hands up in the air like LeBron James with his pregame hand powder ritual. Only she's pretending that it's a shower of candy sprinkles going off like confetti when she wins the race. She'll have her mouth open wide and stick out her tongue as if she's catching them. Like I said, it's always an adventure. Many of us are doing a lot more walking right now. It's an opportunity for us to get out of the house and enjoy the nice weather. It's a chance to wave at neighbors and see what they're doing to spruce up their yards. It's spring, after all. Walking at a steady pace is good exercise as well. And for many of us, it helps us process what is going on in life. Walking alone without earbuds in our ears can give our minds the opportunity to wander and make connections we aren't otherwise able to make when we're busy and distracted. Sometimes it's just an opportunity to have a good conversation and process externally. Each step may make things seem clearer for us. It may even be an opportunity for us to focus and to pray. For a long time, my father practiced a daily morning walking ritual. It didn't matter how hot or cold it was. If the rain was too strong, he might rethink it. But otherwise, each morning he would lace up his shoes and hit the pavement in our hilly neighborhood in the suburbs outside of Atlanta. And as he walked, he would pray. He would pray for people by name. He would start with our family, both immediate and extended. 
He will move on to friends and members of his congregation that he knew were having difficult times. He'd eventually move on to the other things that were weighing on his mind, embracing a psalmist-like practice of bringing petitions and lamentations before the throne of God, or even that relationship that's described of Adam and Eve, who walked and talked with God in the cool of the day like close friends. I have a colleague from seminary who finds walking to be extremely helpful in processing what he's experiencing, what he's thinking and feeling. If he's wrestling with a passage for his next sermon, he will take a walk. Frustrations with church business or congregational needs, and he takes a walk. Family tension, he takes a walk. The practice is so much a part of his life, it is part of his self-care that his wife, who knows him better than he knows himself, will recognize his frustrations and say, you just need to go take a walk. There's something to be said for walking and talking with God. Perhaps one of the most appropriate understandings of the formative relationship with God is a journey. It is moving with and following and walking alongside a creator and redeemer and a sustainer. It's embracing the mountains and valleys of life. It's recognizing the arduous nature of pounding the pavement, but knowing you aren't doing it alone. Sometimes it is walking with the good shepherd beside still waters. And each experience along the way, each step on the journey, wakes us up and makes us more aware of the presence of the work of God in our lives, and it makes us more like Christ, and it enables us to live into God's kingdom. One of the songs I often sing to Hattie when I'm putting her to bed expresses the desire to walk closer with Christ each day. I am weak, but thou art strong, it says. Jesus keeps me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee, granted Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. We see journey with God as one of the guiding metaphors throughout Scripture. Abram and Sarai are told that if they will get up and start a journey with God to the place where God will lead them, then God will bless them so that through them, God can bless the world. And their grandson Jacob is on the run journeying for his life when he has a dream of angels descending and ascending the great stairway to heaven. When he awakes, he names the place Bethel, which means house of God, because he knows that God is in that place. When he spends the night on the shores of the Jabbok River before seeing his brother Esau again, God finds him and wrestles with him, blesses him, and gives him a new path to walk. Ruth tells Naomi that they will journey together where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. We are on this journey together. The disciples knew best of all what it was like to walk with God. Their very calling was rooted in a journey to formation and awakening, and some would say even true spiritual consciousness. Jesus came upon some of them mending their fishing nets, and he said, follow me, and they dropped everything and started walking with him. Some were following John the Baptist, but when Jesus emerged on the scene, John pointed to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It was his way of saying, You've been walking with me up to this point, but you should start walking with him. So they went after him. Where are you staying? they asked. And he simply told them, Come and see. He invited them to take a journey with him. He invited them to walk with him. As they walked, they discovered the power of God unleashed on the world, they heard good news of God's kingdom at hand and on the move. They witnessed miracles. Their understandings of the ways of God and the love of God were unraveled and replaced with something far greater. Their hopes in God's plans for Israel were reoriented and restored. They believed they would soon see a full restoration of the kingdom of their ancestor David. That all oppression would be removed, justice would be given to all people, abundant life would be realized, and they would be at the center of it all. And then their walk with Jesus led to Jerusalem. It led to Golgotha. It led to the cross. It led to the tomb. On that first Easter Sunday, two of his followers were heading down the road to Emmaus. We know that one of them was named Cleopas. The other isn't named, though some suggest it might have been his wife even. We don't know specifically why they were going to Emmaus, but some have suggested that they might have just been going home. That's what you do when the journey ends, isn't it? You end up back at home. You get back to normal, to the way things were before you started walking. That must be even more true when you are grieving. You search out one place where it feels safe and comfortable to process your emotions, to heal. 
We may have never literally walked the road to Emmaus, but we are intimately familiar with it nonetheless. I heard one pastor describe it as the road where disappointment and regret meet. It's the road of broken promises and where hopes are left on the side like hiking gear discarded on the Appalachian Trail when their owners realized they were severely overpacked and what they thought they needed was really useless. It's the road of loss. It's the road of uncertainty where you have no idea what the future will hold. The two followers were walking together, processing their grief. They were discussing all that had taken place in Jerusalem And they must have been questioning what they got wrong and what they misunderstood. And suddenly they realized they were not alone. A stranger begins walking with them. They don't seem to recognize him. He asks them what they're talking about. And we can't imagine how astonished their faces must have been. How could he have not known about the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth? It was the only thing that anyone was talking about. If the internet and social media had been around back then, it would have been trending number one on Twitter and Facebook. The news outlets would have been spinning it in every direction, 24 hours a day. Reporters would have been interviewing priests and rabbis, scholars of the Hebrew scripture, Roman officials and men and women on the street, everyone claiming to have seen part of it, everyone having an opinion of what the impact would be on their world. You can guarantee it would have been turned into a meme pretty quickly. Part of the culture would have been using it to their amusement and to reinforce their seemingly unshakable opinions. All of this while his followers grieved and while they feared for the future. Are you the only one who hasn't been paying attention? They ask him. Jesus of Nazareth, the great prophet who was mighty in deed and word before God and the people, was handed over by the chief priests and leaders of our people to be condemned to death and to be crucified. And then the most honest moment arrives when they say, but we had hoped. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They had placed their hopes, their dreams, their trust in Jesus. And when he took his final breath on the cross, it seemed like it had all been for nothing. Why do you have to die? And suddenly the stranger proves that he knows more than he is letting on. He begins recounting the events of Jesus' own life, his ministry, and his death, and he ties them to the work of God that they know in their scriptures. He helps them see the way that God had always been working to redeem the people of Israel and the world. He recalled the words of the prophets that God's Messiah would suffer and die, but that God would take that moment and use it to rebuild the world. About 10 days ago, I got a text from one of our members It was a video of him and his daughter. She had asked a question. Pastor Matt, she asked, why did Jesus have to die? Over 2,000 years after the crucifixion and resurrection, this is still one of the hardest questions to imagine. How do you begin to describe it to a six-year-old? I was so grateful she was asking that question. I wanted her to keep asking deep questions like that, I didn't want to say the wrong thing, though. I didn't want to mess up her faith in its early stages. So I did the clearest thing I could think to do. I went to the scriptures. I sent her a video message back about Christ's words that God loved the world so much that God's Son was sent so that those who believed in him wouldn't perish, but would be able to live forever with God. I recalled his words that no one has greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend, I told her that God loved us so much that Jesus died and that through his death, God made a way for us to have forgiveness and to have eternal life. What I should have said at the time is what I really love is the way that the writer of John, excuse me, the writer of 1 John describes it. He urges us to love one another because love is from God. And in fact, the very nature of God is love. He says that God's love was revealed among us in this way, that God sent God's only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent God's Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He goes on to tell us that God's love should shape us. He says that since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Maybe it was a message like that that Jesus spoke to them. He wanted them to understand the work of God, but that it didn't look like what they expected. 
It didn't look like what they hoped for. In reality, it was far better. It was far greater. It was far more powerful. Perhaps his words brought some comfort. Perhaps they were intellectually convinced. But still, they didn't recognize him. They hadn't been awoken to the realities of his resurrection. They reached their destination, and he started to go on ahead of them and continue on his journey. But they urged him to stay. They extended hospitality to this stranger. They hosted him until he did the most Jesus thing he could do. He showed them that he is always the host of the heavenly banquet. Just as he had done with the disciples when they were in the upper room, and just as he had done in one way or another countless times with his followers and strangers alike, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to them. And there was something familiar in this action. There was something in it that woke them up to the reality that they didn't even know they were experiencing. And before they could even say anything, he was gone. And finally, they recognized that their hearts had been burning because Christ himself had been with them. When they saw the others and explained what had happened, they told them that they had, he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And I love that. There's something so beautiful in it. Everything came together for them in one simple, concrete moment. But it wasn't in the midst of their grief, necessarily. It wasn't in the debate about the interpretation and meaning of Scripture. It wasn't in a religious service of worship and prayer, even. It was in the most mundane thing imaginable, in sharing a meal and the breaking of bread, and that is when it all finally made sense. They realized that they were experiencing the risen Christ for themselves. That's how it is with Jesus. That's how he works for us and with us. He shows up when we least expect him to. He shows up in the ways we may least expect him to. He shows up when our hopes have been cast aside, when we are grieving, when we are walking the road, where disappointment and regret and an uncertain future meet. He shows up when it feels like the story has been written and we can't stand the way it's turned out, but he reads us in a new way that opens us up to endless possibilities. He shows up in a meal, in a smile, in a hug and a message of love. He shows up in a stranger who offers help when it is needed most. He shows up in the reading of Scripture and in prayer. He shows up as we walk the road of life He shows up and reveals himself in such a way that sadness and discouragement give way to surprise and reorientation. We may not always recognize him, but when we do, our hope is restored because our faith has been repositioned where it should have been all along. New Testament scholar Matt Skinner says it in this way, It feels like a cruel joke that this story appears now during pandemic Easter season. There's not much hilarity in the air, especially among those who are already up to their chins and rising waters of economic misery. Luke's signature resurrection tale sounds like a distant fantasy, containing too many activities that we cannot enjoy right now, including travel and meeting and eating with strangers. Yet emerging out of the desolation of Holy Week, the confident Easter refrains of joy, triumph, defiance, belonging, and commission usually lead us to assume that resurrection means the end of disappointment. Everyone's supposed to smile and shout, He is risen indeed! But Easter faith can be both a resurrection hope and a lamenting restlessness at the same time. He says, I'm so glad that Jesus doesn't reveal himself to Cleopas and his companion right away, but waits. Why does he wait, he asks? Jesus is neither testing, scolding, nor humiliating the shell-shocked couple. He is literally journeying with them. There he is present. As they narrate their disappointment and confusion, he does not cut them off. He knows that explanations will not cure their foolishness and slowness to believe. The time will come to redirect his friends, but first he lets them proceed one heavy step after another. Lament takes time, Skinner says. And sometimes lament is the journey that leads us to recognition and new life. That new life walks alongside us, patiently, whether we know it or not. 
There is no doubt that our entire world is on a strange and difficult part of the journey of life right now. There's plenty to grieve and lament. We are on a road where disappointment and regret meet and where hope may seem lost. We may even feel as though we are walking it completely alone. Everything that we are experiencing may be preventing us from seeing Christ in this moment. But have faith. Believe the good news of God's love revealed in Christ that has sustained people of God for over two millennia. Christ will reveal himself to those who are willing to have their eyes and hearts and even souls opened. And when we finally recognize him, we too will recognize that there was a moment that our hearts were on fire. We couldn't explain it, but suddenly our eyes were opened. We were awoken. We were more spiritually conscious and aware than ever before. We realized that the very presence of new life was walking with us this entire time. Amen.